Hi everyone, I'm Kayla and welcome to my little corner of the criminal content YouTube channel where I will be bringing you true crime stories that have fascinated me that hopefully will fascinate you too. Our first story is the story of international lifelong jewel thief Doris Payne. I forgot the book. Okay, again. Most of the information for this video has come from her book, Diamond Doris, which is super fun. It's such a good read, highly recommend. Doris started stealing when she was 14, and the last time she was arrested was when she was 88. She is now 92, and I personally believe that she would still be stealing if she could. So Doris was born October 10th, 1930 in the mining town of Slab Fork, West Virginia to a black father named Augustus and a Cherokee mother named Clema. She had five siblings, Albert, Louise, Clarence, David Jr., Doris, and then Johnny, her younger brother. So something that you will see time and again in Doris's story is that her driving force was protecting her mother. She says, it wasn't an everyday thing that my father beat my mother, but she was a prisoner. He didn't want her talking to other men and he didn't even want her talking or gossiping with other women. So Doris decided at a young age that she was going to have to be the one to protect her mother. And she also resolved to never let a man cage her the way that her father had caged her mother. This conviction that she was going to have to be the one to protect her mother really came to a head one day when she was about 14, when she witnessed her father abusing her mother and she dumped a pot of steaming hot beans from the stove on her father. And it kind of cemented her relationship with him where they were like, all right, it's you and me. While she was away, Doris's mom would send her clippings of like the new beautiful dresses they had at Saks Fifth Avenue. And Doris had a wall in her room of clippings from like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and those really nice fashion magazines. She would put these clippings from her mom up on the wall. Doris had an innate fascination with and knowledge of fashion and style and class markers that would come to help her later in her career that all started with these magazine clippings. And this is what I am going to call Doris's inciting incident. So when she was in eighth grade, her mom told her that if she kept her grades up, she would buy Doris a watch as a present for getting good grades. And she said, why don't you go down to Mr. Benjamin's store and look at some of the watches and pick one out. So Doris went down to Mr. Benjamin's store and he pulled out a tray of watches for her and he put them on her wrist and they were looking at them. And important to note that Doris describes Mr. Benjamin as an olive skinned man with black hair. So they're trying on the watches and a white man comes in and immediately Mr. Benjamin grabs the watches off of Doris's wrists. And she says, shot me a mean look with his face more angled at this man than at me. He looked at me like somebody he didn't like or didn't want in his way. And he said, run along little girl. And it hit her really hard. It really hurt. But in his hurry to cater to this white man, Mr. Benjamin had left one watch on Doris's wrist. And so she walked toward the door and then she all of a sudden turned back to Mr. Benjamin, all polite. And she said, Mr. Benjamin, you forgot one of the watches on my wrist. And she like walked right up to the counter and put it down. And it seemed like the white man was a little appalled that Mr. Benjamin would trust a little black girl with a watch. And Doris left the store with her head held high. When she got home, she says, I was so mad that I tore off the wall all of my paper dolls of fine white ladies and fine expensive clothes and jewels. I felt demeaned. It was the worst feeling I ever had even today. Those models with their pillbox hats, tapered suits and diamond bracelets weren't better than me. Mr. Benjamin standing there like a king with his jewels locked up wasn't better than me either. I was ready for war against him and all his brothers. Whew. That day in Mr. Benjamin's store, Doris had discovered a skill that she didn't know she had and with it, she discovered a purpose. And so she started training. Eventually, she told her best friend Lillian, I can make people forget that I'm wearing their jewelry and make them know it's all their fault. 
And Lillian was skeptical, so Doris took her to Cleveland to prove it. And they got dressed up. They looked like respectable little young women. They walked into the Woolworths in Cleveland and Doris told Lillian to go sit at the malt counter and she walked up to the jewelry counter. And the salesman asked Doris if she wanted to see the watches in the case. And so she sat down and she told him some lie about how her father had just sold some family land and they had just moved to Cleveland. She was in college, blah, blah, blah. So Doris engaged him in conversation. They talked about the war and the economy and he was like really impressed by her knowledge and he like relaxed into the interaction and she walked away from that jewelry case with a watch under her glove. And then she did what she did to Mr. Benjamin. She turned back to the counter and she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry you forgot to take this watch back, but hold on to it because my daddy's gonna come in tomorrow and he'll buy it. And Lillian was floored. Doris says, we were as high as we could be. We were secretly in control of white men. <laughs> and then that's just what Lillian and Doris did on their weekends from then on. And eventually Doris wanted to level up and she wanted to start making money and actually taking the jewelry instead of returning it as a power trip. So she turned her attention to styling herself. She learned how to dress, how to talk, how to walk that made her look high class and moneyed so that it would seem like she didn't have to steal anything. And here she discovered her first important lesson about stealing jewelry. The key to getting away with stealing jewels, confusion and familiarity. So employing her new tactics and skills, Doris actually started making money from stealing and she brought it home to her mother. She never really told her where she was getting the money. Eventually, her mom got a job at a department store in Cleveland and together with the money that Doris was earning from stealing, they moved out of Slab Fork, West Virginia without Doris's father. Doris was 18 when they moved and she got pregnant that year. While she was pregnant, Doris stayed at the Phyllis Wheatley House for single pregnant black women, which was right down the street from their apartment. And all the women at the home got jobs at the Euclid Manor nursing home down the street. And Doris got a job at the nursing home and she used her money to buy herself beautiful clothes and shoes and accessories to wear once she was no longer pregnant and went back to stealing. So Doris had a son named Ronald. She moved back in with her mother. When Ronald was four, Doris got pregnant again. Um, she had not stayed with Ronald's father, but he was still in the picture. He was the father of the daughter they would have. She says, we thought about getting married, but I didn't ever want to get married. I believed and still believe it's wise for women to accept being in love, but to assume the responsibility of providing for themselves. That married piece of paper just ties you to brutality. And we see again, back to this theme of protecting her mother and protecting herself from men. So they named their daughter Rhonda and Doris went right back into stealing. So at the nursing home, Doris had a friend named Norma who had told her she was having trouble affording her mother's health care. So one day Doris put Norma in one of her very nice dresses and she took her over to the May Company department store and she said, slump over a bit and look like one of those wafy Victorian heiresses. And so they went to the jewelry counter and Doris was like, this rich white lady is my patient and she's getting married soon and we want to see your wedding band so that she can pick something out and tell the groom what to buy. She describes the clerk as kind of an older looking guy. He softened up even more watching Norma tremble trying on rings. I almost cracked up. She was really playing the part. The clerk thought that whoever was marrying her shaky ass was sure doing it for the money. <laughs> so... So the clerk bent down to get something in the case and Doris took this opportunity to slip a small diamond ring into Norma's pocket. And then she told the clerk, we'll have to come back tomorrow. Miss Rockford isn't feeling well. And they left. The ring that she stole was worth $1,500 then, which is $14,000 today. She pawned the ring. She gave Norma money for her mother's medical bills. And then she took the rest of the money and used it to buy a nicer wedding set at a different pawn shop. She said that wearing it, she looked like a married, moneyed woman of class. So Doris spent her weekends 
training and perfecting her methods and planning her first heist. She says, I knew to ask to see several rings, to talk to the clerk to pure distraction, all the while doing three card Monty moves with the rings until I was wearing one more than I entered the store wearing. So for her first heist, she took the bus from Cleveland to Pittsburgh and walked straight to the Clark building, which was the home of MGM Studios. On the second floor of the Clark building, quote, the finest jewelers catered to movie stars coming and going from the building. There was no security in the store when Doris walked in. There was just two clerks and two white women shopping. Doris told the clerk that she was looking for a two carat diamond, something beautiful for evening attire. The clerk brought out a tray of rings between $5,000 and $20,000. She had her eye on the $20,000 piece, which is worth $187,000 now. And she did just as she practiced. She bantered, she established familiarity, she confused the clerk who then brought out one too many cases and she walked out of the store promising that her husband would be back in the morning and on her finger was a $20,000 emerald cut diamond ring. So Doris went straight to the bus station and then she immediately panicked and she decided that taking a Greyhound bus home with a $20,000 ring on her finger was a stupid idea. So she called her mom, her mom didn't pick up. She had planned to go to the park with Rhonda that day. So Doris waited an hour and she called back and her mom answered and Doris just couldn't bring herself to admit what she had done. And she was stuck in this bus station, frozen, paranoid that the police were just waiting for her to walk up to the ticket counter. So she called her mother back. At this point, it was 3 p.m. She still didn't tell her what was going on. At this point, she had spent all of her money calling her mom and not saying anything. So she couldn't even afford a bus ticket home if she wanted to take the bus home. So she spent the night in a bathtub in the bus station bathroom with the ring in her bra. So the next morning she woke up, dusted herself off, slipped that ring right back onto her finger and walked out of the bus station where she saw a gold lame robe in the window of a store called Rahal. And she went into the store and asked the saleswoman to show her the beautiful robe. And as she was looking through the sizes, she made sure to flash her ring. And obviously the saleswoman noticed and she asked her about it and Doris, broke down into sobs and told the saleswoman this story about how she was recently divorced and the ring was the last thing from her husband that she needed to sell. She said, I can't be reminded any longer of my husband and his affairs with other actresses. <laughs> so of course the saleswoman completely melted. She called over the manager who looked at the ring and just asked Doris how much she wanted for it. She says, I divided by three. I figured at least three people had owned it before me the Africans who had gotten it out of the ground, the people who bought raw diamonds on the black market, and the people in Brussels who got rich by mutilating diamonds, polishing them, and standing them on an auction block for European trade. So she quoted the manager $7,000 and she walked out of the store with the equivalent of $65,000 now. And she splurged and took a cab all the way back to Cleveland. So at this point, Doris figured that if she was making this kind of money stealing jewelry, she had to tell her mom what was going on. So she did, and her mom wasn't thrilled about what she was doing, but you know, Doris is a grown woman and there was a lot of money coming in, so she didn't fight it. And the next day, Doris went down the street and bought a house for her and her mom, cash. So the next week, Doris was already ready for her next heist, and this time she targeted the most upscale department store on Euclid Avenue which is where she had seen what she calls the Blue Vein Elite Blacks shop. So this store closed at 5 p.m. Doris got in a cab at four because another important lesson she had learned about stealing is the best time to steal was during break times, during shift changes, and right before closing. So in this store, there was one man working the jewelry counter and Doris immediately noticed something was a little bit off. His necktie wasn't tied right. His suit seemed a little rumpled. She says she suspected she was dealing with a redneck dressed up like a fine jewelry clerk. So she did her usual thing. She got him talking. He told her about his niece who was graduating from college and she got him to get 10 pieces out of the case at a time. That's way too many pieces. 
Something to note here is that in order to keep their insurance, jewelers were supposed to have five pieces or less of jewelry out of the case at a time. If they had more than that out of the case and one went missing and they reported it to the police, the police could report negligence to the insurance company and the stores could lose their insurance. Doris says, many of the stores were glad the piece was never found. Then they could report the loss as much higher than the value of the piece. So the lights blinked, indicating that the store was closing, and Doris says, we frantically collected the rings from the counter. I was still wearing the one he showed me. She said her father would be back the next day to make the purchase, and then she walked out of the store with the ring on her finger. And she went to the street to hail a cab, and a police car pulled up, and she was asked to get inside. And she said, oh no, has one of my parents been in an accident? And the cop said, no, the clerk from that store just called and said an N-word in a green dress had taken some jewelry. So Doris pulled out Old Faithful and she said, you know what, oh my God, we tried on so many rings, I completely forgot this was on here. And she says the cop assessed her and saw that the jewelry that she was wearing was worth more than the ring she hadn't stolen. And so he took it back. He told her to watch herself and hailed her a cab himself. And Dora says, I learned something new in my training that day. If I walked out of a store forgetting I was wearing the ring and they caught me, I could just give it back and let them know that Fred or whoever was calling me an N-word had forgotten what he was doing. They would take one look at my clothing and class status and let me go. So now that Doris was stealing things worth a lot of money, the next thing she needed to figure out was, how to sell those pieces without it being traced back to her. So in the fall of 1957, Doris met a Jewish woman named Ada Lurch in Woolworths, who right off the bat was like, "Ugh, you know, I just got out of jail. I had some legal trouble with the brothel I run. And Doris was like, okay, 100%, I can tell this woman about my crime problems. And Ada was like, you have to meet my other Jewish friend, Harold Bronfield, AKA Babe, he can connect you with some serious buyers. Doris describes Babe as the first Jewish boy to go to Alabama State. He was well connected with a lot of politicians and moneyed athletes and as well connected to the shady side as you can get. So Doris wanted to show Babe that she wasn't all talk. So she went to Montreal where she had her eye on a piece at Burks and Sons in the financial district. And Doris had this way about her where when she turned on the charm, People literally thought she was a movie star and they would be like, who is that? So she walked into Burks and Sons, turned it on. The male clerk was off his guard from second one. She flirted, she flustered him, and then she mentioned twice that her driver was waiting outside to take her to more shopping, which made the clerk want to make this sale even more. So like so many before him, he brought out one too many trays. She did her usual charming routine. She swapped the rings around. She told him she would think about it. She put her gloves back on over a two carat round diamond ring surrounded by a halo setting of tiny blue sapphire stones she forgot she was wearing and left. So a few days later, ring in hand, Doris went to meet Babe for the first time. She says he was 6'4", black wavy hair, olive skin. She writes in the book that Russell Crowe <laughs> reminds her of Babe. So he was holding court in the club he owned. It was the middle of the day and Doris walked in head high. She went straight to him. She said, my name is Doris Payne. I'd like to have a word with you. Ada Lurch sent me your way. And she told him that she wanted him to sell her jewelry at one third of what it was worth and that anything over that price was his to keep. She showed him the ring from Montreal and he was like, you stole this? And she said, if you end up my buyer, don't question me. I wouldn't have come to you if I wasn't capable. Incredible. She says, it was a deal. I wouldn't work for him and he wouldn't work for me. And they formed a partnership. And so she told Babe how she did it. And he was like, no way. I wanna see this in action. So he told her he knew of a jewelry store in Philadelphia. He said, I'll take you there, but I'll also call a few folks who can get you out on bail because, hun, we're about to find out that my brothers are not that stupid. So the store was a little family owned place. When they got in, Babe went to talk to the owner and Doris went to the only sales clerk there, a woman. And once she was locked in and the woman started talking and she stopped paying attention, Doris had her eye on a clear cut emerald diamond. She says, 
Once it was on my finger, intuitively, Babe set up a distraction. He asked the owner about his daughter, who was the clerk. The owner waved her over and she left Doris looking at the rings and Doris just walked out of the store. They got back to Cleveland that night and now it was Babe's turn to hold up his side of the bargain. He had to prove that he could sell this jewelry. The next night, Babe called Doris and said, I can't sell this piece without you going to jail. He said, they described you to a T. I've talked with the DA in Philly. They're going to come and pick you up if you don't self-surrender. However, Babe knew the DA, he knew the judge, and he said, this is all a formality. If you self-surrender, the DA and the judge have it all arranged. I have a lawyer meeting you at the precinct. So Doris went to the precinct, she self-surrendered, she had an attorney waiting for her, she was fingerprinted, she was photographed. They asked her no questions and she was in and out. Babe met her at the airport and he said, this is just part of it, hun. If you're gonna deal in moving big gems, you're gonna have the business of going down and satisfying the judge with a confession of guilt, then having your money connections post bail while a well-connected lawyer handles the rest. The bail is part of the cost of doing business. So Babe laid low for a week and then sold the diamond and they got their money and a beautiful partnership began. So Doris used this money to send the kid's dad what she calls a big fat check. And he somehow figured out how she was making the money and he took her to court. And he said the kids needed to live with him full time because Doris was a criminal and she needed to pay child support. So she went to see a judge in Cleveland and the judge said, having a criminal record doesn't make you an unfit mother. You just need to financially provide for your children and have a stable home for them with routines and an everyday life. And Doris, realized she could financially provide for her children, but she couldn't give them a stable everyday life. So the kids went to go live with their dad. So Babe was married to a nice lady named Myra. Doris was sleeping with Babe, but Myra didn't care. Doris describes her, she came from money and was a good person to talk with about fashion. Romance and domestic life was for Babe and Myra. Sex and business was for Babe and me. However, Doris never let Babe sleep at her house. Her rule was never any nighttime activity unless we were out of town or out on the town. A man wasn't going to sleep at my house, not even Babe. My home was our playhouse by day and a safe haven for me and my mom at night. So Doris moved to Los Angeles in the early 1960s and she set up in a little extended stay motel near the airport, which she called her little crow's nest and she would sell the smaller pieces she was stealing at like clubs and stuff. And then Babe would fly in and collect the bigger pieces and take them back to Cleveland to sell. Then in August, 1965, Doris went to a little jewelry store in Pasadena called BD House and Sons Jewelers. She says she got a real cute ring worth around $4,000, which is $32,000 now and got away clean. Then one night that November, there was an article about her theft in Pasadena that pinned it on Marguerite Mays, nay, and now again, Marguerite Wendell Chapman, who was the ex-wife of the baseball player, Willie Mays. And Marguerite was another black woman. She was cleared, but it was like not a good look for Pasadena to be like blaming it on a black woman that they had no evidence for just because they like needed to get it pinned on a black woman. So then the police showed up at Doris's door at her extended stay motel and they took her into custody even though they didn't have anything specific to detain her for. Babe had sold the piece from the Pasadena theft a long time ago. It couldn't be traced to her. So Babe set her up with a lawyer in LA named Richard Caballero who told her that the police didn't have anything on her and he thought they were just detaining her to try to get the Marguerite Mays stuff <laughs> in the past. So they sent her to the Sybil Brand Institute for Women, which Doris describes as a cross between a women's prison and a college campus. She spent a few days there and then she was transported to a Pasadena jail. She called her lawyer who was like, don't say anything. And then 20 minutes later, she was taken back to Sybil Brand and then the next day she was released on bail. So Doris made her way back to Cleveland. She had a layover in Phoenix where the FBI picked her up and took her back to California. And she called Babe, who was like, absolutely not. When she landed in LA, 
she got a call from one of Babe's contacts who told her the name of a bail bondsman to call. So Doris got off on bail and she wasn't allowed to leave the state until her hearing. She did eventually get off, but she was assigned a prison number. So on paper, it looked like she had served time. In the summer of 1966, two important things happened for Doris. The first is that she bought a home in the suburb of Shaker Heights. And the second is that she met her best friend, Shirley. One night at the bar that Shirley worked at, she introduced Doris to a man named Kenneth Tolliver and the two of them immediately clicked. Babe was immediately jealous and Doris was immediately turned off and over Babe. So they continued doing business, but the sexual part of their relationship ended. Babe never came over to Doris's house anymore. They did business at his house. She hung out with Myra and Babe was heartbroken and desperate to get Doris back. So he got a tummy tuck. A day after his surgery, Babe started having complications, but he didn't want to go to the hospital because he knew a bunch of people there and he didn't want them to know that he had gotten a tummy tuck. His doctor was afraid that he had thrombosis. He did. He was given blood thinners and an exercise regimen. Um, he continued to monitor Doris's activity from afar. He continued to pine after her. And then one night, Doris got a call from Myra telling her that Babe had died. And three months after Babe died, Doris started sleeping with Kenneth, and she described it as, unlike any closeness I had allowed with a man. So now Doris had to figure out how to do her work without Babe. Her face was officially too recognizable in the United States, so she decided to take her talents to Europe. Her first stop was in the late summer of 1974. She went to Monte Carlo. She stayed at the Hotel de Paris. She said, this was the real shit, a palace looking building. So the morning after she got there, Doris got dressed to the nines to go after a piece at Cartier. When she walked in, she was the only customer in the store. The server came over and brought her a tray. And just as that tray was put down, some other customers walked in. So the server brought one more tray with Doris and went to help another customer and she had them. She waited for the clerk to turn away and she slipped a 10.5 carat ring on her finger worth $2.5 million today. And then she was like, oh, my driver's here. I gotta go, I'll come back tomorrow to make my purchase. And she walked out with the ring. She walked back to her hotel and she took a cab straight to the Nice airport without changing her clothes. Mistake number one. She got to the airport early and decided to just wait for her flight. Mistake number two. She says, I learned the most important thing that day. An international jewel thief has to get into the air, off the ground, out of the jurisdiction of where she stole. Get anywhere as long as it's a flight out of the country where she took the damned ring. So Doris didn't do this. As she was waiting for her flight, two Air France workers approached and took her into custody. They technically couldn't do this, but Doris didn't want to make a scene because she had a $2.5 million stolen ring on her. So she went quietly. So she got into the holding room and she was like, are you guys going to strip search me? And they said yes. And so she <laughs> took a little Kleenex out and blew her nose. And she was like, it's so cold. Can we do it like one piece of clothing at a time so I don't get too cold? And they we're like, yeah, whatever. So <laughs> when she blew her nose, she had taken the ring off her finger and put it in her left hand. With it in her left hand, she took her pantyhose off. As she put them back on, she slid the ring into the Kleenex, folded it up and tucked it into the back of her pantyhose. She then took one piece of clothing off at a time, whatever, to keep warm, kept the ring in the back of her pantyhose. While they were waiting for the police to show up, Doris asked for some nail clippers to keep her nails looking nice. And then she asked for a needle and thread to fix the hem of her skirt. She took the ring and she sewed it into the hem of her skirt and it stayed there for months. The police took Doris to jail, but there wasn't a women's jail in Monte Carlo, so they just had this like beautiful hotel set up where they kept women who were supposed to be in jail, and Doris was assigned a woman from the embassy to come check on her every week. She had a room overlooking the Mediterranean. She was there for nine months. While she was there, she hatched a plan. One week, Doris faked stomach pains knowing that when women got sick at this hotel jail, 
they were taken to the hospital. So when she got to the hospital, she was assigned a room and then she just walked out of the hospital. And as she walked out, she saw a Nigerian man getting into a very nice car and she went up to him and she was like, I'm here with my fiance, he got stopped for drugs, can you give me a ride to Paris? And the guy was like, yeah. <laughs> so in Paris, this guy just booked her a hotel room and she called Kenneth for help. He sent his daughter, Linda, who showed up with some extra clothes for Doris. Doris, at this point, needed a passport. And then a couple of days later, the Nigerian guy came back to check on her and she was like, I need help getting out of France. And he was like, I got you. And then he took them to a hotel near the Belgian border. And he was like, when you check in, they will ask you for your passport. Tell them you have it, put away in your purse for safekeeping, but you can read them the numbers and then just make up the numbers. So the next morning he posed as their driver he took them to the border. He told the guy at the border that one of them had lost their passport. And the guy was like, okay, have fun in Belgium. Here's the address for the embassy where you can get an emergency passport. So they went to the embassy. She got an application. She used the name Thelma Crichton Wright, which she says, I thought that shit sounded like some rich woman. <laughs> and then the Nigerian guy got them to Germany. Linda flew straight home from there. Doris flew to New York via two other countries and she just made it out without a passport. When she got back, Kenneth had found a buyer for the Cartier piece that Doris brought back. They sold the piece and they solidified a business partnership between the two of them. So Doris stayed in New York to plan what I'm gonna call her Euro trip of jewel thievery. Her stops were Gerard and Company, jeweler to the British crown, Van Cleef and Arpels, jeweler to the French elite and the Iranian crown, and Bulgari, quote, jeweler to Jesus himself from what I heard. So she left for Europe September 1975. First stop, London, Gerard and Company. When she got into the store, she told the clerk she was looking for emeralds and diamonds. So the clerk opened up the appropriate cabinets, showed her the trays, and then stepped away. And in the time it took for him to walk from Doris to the door of the room, she had already taken a pair of earrings and a ring. So she spent the next few hours like sending him back and forth, having him pull different pieces, trying to confuse him, but he kept really good count. And then finally the lights dimmed like it was closing time and she <laughs> sat real close to him and leaned in and spoke to him all quiet like they were on an intimate date and started asking him questions about himself and he finally lowered his defenses. He was distracted enough to lose count of what he was doing. He brought her too many trays. She pulled all of her moves. And two hours later, she was on a flight to Paris. She stayed at the Ritz in Paris. And the next morning she went to Van Cleef and Arpels, which was actually like right in the courtyard of the hotel, basically. So at the store, the manager brought out too many trays right out the gate. And Doris thought maybe he was trying to trick her. So she called over another woman in the store and she said, oh my gosh, look at all these beautiful watches. Wouldn't these be great for our husbands? And they like giggled and had girl time and looked at these watches. While they were doing this, Doris was able to pocket a white gold watch with eight tiny diamonds and two rubies. And then she was like, anyway, gotta go meet my husband, but we should double date for dinner tonight. And then an hour and a half later, she was on a flight to Rome with a $55,000 watch in her pocket, which is $250,000 now. So the next day in Rome, she planned to walk around, look at Bulgari, case the joint, and then go back the next day to steal. But when she got outside the store, the doorman like clocked her and smiled. And she was like, well, now I have to go in and do this today. So in the store, she notes that the servers were really hot. And she was like, they greet you with a hot man and a glass of champagne. And basically their move is to have a hot man get you drunk and sell you as much as he can. So she obviously was not falling for that. The hot server immediately brought out too many trays and she didn't even have to confuse him. And so she tried on a bunch of rings. She made sure not to put them down where she picked them up from. <laughs> she says this, I wet my lips as often as he wet his. I got him. 
He didn't notice my hand move like a snake to the tray and slip the ring onto my middle finger. So then she said something giggly about having to pee and she just walked right out the door and she got a cab to her hotel. She changed, she got back in the cab. She went straight to the airport, caught the first flight out, which happened to be to Syria. And then she caught a flight to Iran and then a flight to New York City where she went to her new buyer that she found through Kenneth she sold all of her treasures and then went straight back to Cleveland. So fast forward to October 1980. Doris is almost 50 and her mom kind of laid into her about having a normal life and Doris was pissed off. So she left the country, no plan. She went to France, she got cold feet. She flew to Zurich immediately without even leaving the airport. So she called for a car at her hotel a guy came and picked her up and she had planned to go to a jewelry store, but somehow he convinced her to go out with him. Doris had never had a drink in her life, but for some reason that day she decided to. They went to a rooftop bar and then she had him take her to the shopping district where she went into Rolex. And then the next thing she remembers is coming back out of Rolex. She doesn't remember what happened in the store. She completely lost that time. And then, the guy took her to Davos, Switzerland. They went to a club and Doris partied hard until all of a sudden she was like, I have to leave. So she went to coat check and she wasn't thinking and she gave the guy her real name. And she says that she turned around and there was a line of policemen waiting for her. There's a documentary about Doris that I believe says something about the club being broadcast on television and that and someone called in a sighting of her not sure how that works if that's true but that's one thing i've heard about it either way the police found her at this club so the police put a completely trashed doris onto a night train to the embassy in french switzerland and doris's guard was like it was her first shift and she was really excited and she was like you're my first criminal and she told Doris that they put her on the night train because night trains don't make stops, so Doris couldn't escape. However, this night train made a stop to get water. So Doris asked if she could go to the bathroom, the guard said yes, and Doris just hopped off the train when it stopped for water. It was like 4 a.m. at this point. So Doris ran off into a cornfield to wait for morning, and then the next morning, she went back to the station and found two cabs waiting for the morning train to come in. So she hopped in one of them and went back to Zurich. She somehow made it to the hotel, still drunk. She grabbed her luggage, went back to the train station, and she doesn't really remember most of this. It's spotty. On the train, she opened her purse and found a men's Rolex that she presumably had stolen when she was blackout. So Doris got off the train in Lausanne, Switzerland. She spent the next couple of days there panicking and then she called Linda to come get her. Linda met her in Geneva with some new clothes and stayed there with her for a couple days until Doris decided she needed to leave the country. At this point, it was November. They hired a car at the hotel and the guy said he knew a place where they could cross the border I don't know how she keeps running into these people. So, so they got to the border and it was snowing so hard that the guy at the booth didn't even want to come outside and he just let them through. So Doris flew back to New York and just went immediately home to her mom's house. Soon after Doris got back to Cleveland, her mom was diagnosed with late stage lung cancer, which is very common for people who lived in coal towns. Um, her body did not respond to the radiation and she was too old for surgery and the doctors gave her a year. And then Doris says two years into it, she was still laughing. And then a guy from the FBI started showing up at Doris's mom's house because that is the address that Doris had put on her fake passport. Doris's mom told the FBI guy that Doris was out of the country, but she was convinced that the FBI guy would keep coming back and she told Doris she needed to leave Cleveland. Coincidentally, Shirley had also found herself in a spot of trouble and was also getting out of Cleveland. She was going to Chicago, so Doris decided to move with Shirley to Chicago. In Chicago, Shirley got them a job scraping cocaine off the inside of baggies using razor blades. 
So Doris stayed in Chicago. She made money scraping bags. She went to visit her mom on weekends. The FBI guy was still showing up. This was now three years into her mom's battle with cancer. Doris had been in Chicago for four years. They were seven years into her mom's battle with lung cancer when Doris went to Ohio for her daughter Rhonda's 33rd birthday party. When she left the party, Doris took a bus to Cleveland to see her mom. When Doris got to her mom's house, her mom's husband, Robert, asked her to stay with her mom while he went to the store. Strangely, almost minutes after Doris arrived at her mom's house, her mom passed away. And then soon after her mom's funeral, Doris went and self-surrendered to the Cleveland Police Department for passport fraud. So she was sent to federal prison in New York. The New York judge sentenced her to 45 days. After a month, Rhonda showed up with a lawyer. Doris was out the next day. She went back to Cleveland and found that the feds had raided her house and taken all of her legally obtained jewelry. So she put all of her stuff in storage and went back to Chicago. She went back to her job scraping bags. And after two years, she was back on her feet and she wanted to get back in the game. And then the day after she turned 60, Doris took her new alias, Audrey Davis, to the airport and flew to Tokyo. The night she landed in Tokyo, she met a drunk business executive at her hotel bar who told her that Cartier was the finest jewelry store in Tokyo and that he would take her the next day. So the next day he met her at the hotel with a limo and then he dropped her off in the shopping district and she said, go and do whatever you want, just come meet me back here in an hour. So Doris went to Cartier, she was in there for 15 minutes and she left with three diamond rings and she was at the airport before the businessman even came back to pick her up. She flew straight back to New York, she sold the rings for $500,000 of our money and then a week later she left for Greece. So she used a hotel in Athens as her hub and she would steal in Greece, sell jewelry in Amsterdam and then she would party in Cairo and she was there for nine months and when she returned to Chicago she found Shirley alone in her apartment wasting away from liver cancer. So she moved in and stayed with Shirley for two months until she passed away. Two weeks after Shirley died, Kenneth told Doris that he had stomach cancer. Kenneth died a month later. For the next 13 years, Doris, as she says, acted up with God after he took my Shirley and my Kenneth. I hit every damn jewelry store in every damn state and didn't feel one damn bit worn out. Spring of 2007, Doris is 77 years old. She's living in Cleveland. She saw a square cut diamond worth $55,000 being advertised at a store in Denver. So she went to Denver, she took the ring, she went to Philadelphia to see her brother Clarence who was dying in the hospital of brain cancer. And this is just how her life went at the time. She says, I took jewels and God kept taking people. In Philadelphia, some guy recognized her from an Interpol poster in the airport in Switzerland and called security on her in a mall, even though she wasn't there to steal anything. She was taken to the precinct and even though they confirmed that it was her in the photo, they couldn't hold her because she wasn't wanted in the US for anything. But news about her 50 year long dossier that Interpol had got out and she says, folks were mesmerized by the estimated value of what I had stolen over the years and that I had never done any real time. I was considered notorious. So Denver extradited Doris from Philadelphia. She was sentenced to a women's prison in Colorado where she stayed for nine days until they flew her back to Cleveland because they didn't have the right facilities for a non-violent offender of her age. Then, thinking they were being clever, they handed her over to the state of Ohio, where the man who was Babe's best man was in charge of all the prisons. Doris says, 
They released me into the hands of the people who wore the shit I had stolen. So she was sent to a halfway house an hour outside of Cleveland where she spent nine months. In 2011, at age 81, Doris went back to LA and back to an extended stay motel near the airport. And one day she went to Palm Desert and in her own words, she got too confident. So she picked up a piece at a store in Palm Desert. She went immediately to San Diego where she picked up two more pieces and then she went back to her motel in LA two days later. The police showed up at her door and took her to the Palm Desert jail. She went to trial with a lawyer who had been recommended to her by her Colorado lawyer. She was released from Palm Desert jail into a halfway house on probation. And then her Colorado lawyer recommended another lawyer who would defend her for many years. Doris's actual hearing was in the summer of 2013. She was sentenced to five years without bail in the Central California Women's Prison Facility, a facility for violent offenders. Doris served 18 months and in that time she was in the infirmary six times for intestinal pain. When Doris returned to Cleveland, she found that the bank had foreclosed on her home so she sold everything she had left and she went to Atlanta where she rented an apartment. One day in Atlanta, she collapsed in a mall and she woke up in a hospital. She had a bad intestinal infection. One of the black nurses took a particular interest in helping Doris. Apparently when Doris was really out of it on painkillers, a producer came in and with the help of the nurse, convinced Doris to sign away her life rights. And then when Doris got out of the hospital, that nurse just took her home with her. Doris says, I felt like a prisoner with her coming home being like mama this and mama that. She didn't even have a landline telephone and where were the people who were supposed to be telling my story? So one day she escaped and she went down to a McDonald's where she begged to use the phone. She called her son and then her attorney who both said, leave that woman's house and find out what you signed in the hospital. Her next stop was a Walmart where she was caught for shoplifting and then was let go on house arrest with an ankle monitor. Her attorney also informed her that the contract for her story was not enforceable because quote, it had been signed under duress and when she was not of sound body. And then once she was free from that scary nurse, Doris went back to her penthouse apartment in Atlanta. She says, I stayed in the comfort of my penthouse for days that all ran into each other. In December 2018, she finished her book. The movie rights have been acquired by trustworthy people this time, and they are currently in pre-production for a movie starring Tessa Thompson. Doris Payne is currently 92 years old and still thriving. And between you and me, I am 100% sure that if she could, she would still be stealing. So that's the story of lifelong international jewel thief, Doris Payne. I hope you liked it as much as I did. Um, again, her book is called Diamond Doris. This is not sponsored. I just really like this book. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe so you can be in the know when I bring you my next true crime story time. I don't know if that's what I'm going to call it. It's a little rhymey. Anyway, bye.